So welcome to the second part of this podcast on iterative methods. Uh, in the first part, I uh, showed you three different methods uh, that we might use to calculate the square root of two uh, numerically. And we found that the first two uh, just didn't work. Uh, the answers diverged, whereas the third one, our sequence of answers got closer and closer to, the, to what we wanted. So the question is, why did that one work and the others didn't? Uh, and to illustrate that, I'm just going to show you uh, methods one and three to contrast them. And the way to see it, or the easiest way to see it, is uh, graphically. So let's take method one, where our iteration function was x squared plus x minus two. And I'm going to take uh, some x and y axes. And I'm going to draw, first of all, the line y equals x. So this is the line y equals x. And then I'm going to draw, or sketch at least, the graph of g of x. So you should know how to sketch a quadratic. Uh, well, g of x, uh, let's look for the turning points of this, or where is the turning point of this quadratic. Well, g dashed, the derivative of g, dg by dx, if you like, is just 2x plus 1. And you can see that that will be 0 when x is minus a half. So this quadratic will have a turning point at minus a half. And we can see it will intersect the y-axis if we put x equals 0 at minus 2. So its graph will be something like this. And this is the graph of well, y equals g of x. Now, there's a special point in this diagram, and that's where these two curves intersect. And this point is no other than x star, our solution we're trying to find, right? Because remember I said that in the previous uh, video that x star has to equal g of x star. So this point here is x star, uh, which is root 2, right? So what happens when we do the iteration? Well, you can think of it like this. We start with a point x0. And the first thing we do is calculate g of x0. So graphically, that means that we go up vertically until we hit the curve g of x at the point g of x0. Then we have to say x1 is g of x0. So if you think about it a bit, that corresponds to horizontally coming across until we meet the curve or the line y equals x. So we come across horizontally, and then this value of x will be equal to that value g of x0. Then we calculate g of x1. So we take this x1 and we find where g is. And this point here is g of x1. We go across, that tells us x2. We calculate g of x2, go to x3, and so on. And you can see quite clearly that this thing is getting further and further away from the solution where we want to end up. And that was indeed what we saw before uh, with the calculator. So what's different in this method three? Well, I'm going to again draw my line y equals x. And now I have to draw my curve g in this case. Uh, well, this is a little bit harder to sketch, x over 2 plus 1 over x. But again, I'm going to find the turning points of this function. So g dashed is going to be derivative of x over 2, which is a half, plus the derivative of 1 over x. So this is x to the power of minus 1. So it's minus 1 over x squared. So I can uh, tidy this up a little bit, write it as a single fraction, x squared minus 2 
over 2x squared. And you can see from this that this thing is going to have a turning point where the numerator is 0, in other words, at the point root 2. So at our x star point itself, this function is going to have a turning point. So here's our x star point. And this function has a turning point. Now, if we take uh, the value of g as x goes to 0, then this first term goes to nothing, but the second term will blow up towards positive infinity. So we know our function is going to come down like this and have a turning point, uh, a u point here, a minimum, a local minimum, if you like. And then as x goes further and further to infinity, uh, there's no more turning points, and uh, the second term is going to get smaller and smaller, and the first term is going to dominate. And so it's again going to head off back up to infinity. So it's going to somehow come up here. So this is my function g of x. So y equals g of x. OK, so let's try our iteration. Um, we'll start from our value x0. Remember, we calculate g of x0. Then we go across horizontally uh, till we meet the curve y equals x, and that gives us x1. Then we calculate g of x1. Then we go across horizontally. And whoop, we're almost, at least on the scale of my picture, we've already reached the solution. And this kind of backs up what we saw before, that this function is converging towards the solution. So what is it that's making the difference? Well, it's simply the slope of this uh, curve g of x. In this case, the slope is bigger than 1. Right? It's above this blue line. So it means that every time we go up, we get further away. In the other case, the slope is below that of the blue line. So it means that we head down towards the root. So you can estimate whether your method is going to work by calculating the slope of g at the solution itself, if you're able to do that. So if g dashed of x star is greater than 1, as in this case, then it diverges. Whereas if g dashed of x star is less than 1, as in the second case, then it converges. So this is a rule, if you like, that will tell you whether your method that you've thought of is actually going to work or not. So the last thing I want to talk about is something called the Newton-Raphson method that you may well have seen during your A-level studies. And uh, this is a method for solving equations of the same type we've been looking at, f of x equals 0. And the formula you might know is that you calculate the next uh, estimate by subtracting f divided by f primed, where f primed is, again, the derivative of the function f. So it's kind of a general purpose method uh, for any function f, uh, providing that the derivative is non-zero. Because if the derivative was 0, you have to divide by 0 and you get in trouble. Um, but we can write this in the same way that we had our iterative methods before. Um, this stuff on the right-hand side is just the function g. So g, g of x for this method is x minus f of x over f dashed of x. And you can see from this that g of x star if you put in x star, is x star minus f of x star over f dashed of x star. But f of x star is 0, because x star is the solution. So this numerator here is 0. So g of x star is equal to x star. So it satisfies that required property that we had at the beginning. Uh, does it work? So we remember we also found that for it to work, we need its slope, g, g dashed, to be less than 1. So what's the slope here? Well, we have to do some 
differentiation, we've got to differentiate g. We know the derivative of x is 1. Then we have to differentiate this quotient. And you hopefully remember that we need to use the quotient rule to differentiate this. And the quotient rule is uh, on the top, you put the, the bottom times the derivative of the top. I don't know how exactly you remember this. Uh, and then you subtract the top times the derivative of the bottom. And you divide by the bottom squared. So just for economy, I've left out all the x's here. But they're still there, really. Now, this can simplify a bit, right? Because here we've got f primed squared divided by f prime squared. So if we split up this fraction into two terms, we'll get a minus 1, which will cancel out this one. So we'll end up with minus times minus, so plus f of x, f double primed of x over f primed squared of x. So what, remember what I said we should do is calculate the slope at the solution x star. Well, if we put in x star into this formula, we're going to have an f of x star multiplying it. But f of x star is 0. So this derivative is going to be 0. So what this tells us is that this, this um, method is very flat. This function g is very flat near to the solution. And that means that the convergence is going to be very quick. It's going to work very well. So essentially, that explains uh, why this Newton method is so popular, uh, because it has this very good property uh, that it converges very quickly. So the very last thing, let's try and uh, see what this Newton method gives us for our problem of finding root 2. Well, in our case, we have g of x is equal to, uh, well, x minus f of x, which, remember, was x squared minus 2 in this example, divided by f prime of x, derivative of that, 2x. OK, so we can simplify this. Um, we split up the fraction into 2. We're going to take away minus x over 2. And then we have a minus times a minus plus and then 2 over 2, 1 over x. And if we simplify this even further, this is x over 2 plus 1 over x. And you might recognize, hopefully, that this is exactly our method 3 that we just had earlier on. Uh, so it's not surprising that our method 3 works so well uh, because it has this property of g dashed equals 0. And in fact, uh, this method, uh, far from being invented by Newton in the uh, 17th century, was invented by at least uh, the ancient Babylonians in about 2,000 years BC, because we have evidence in a, a stone tablet that they used this formula to calculate the uh, square root of 2. I think it was to about six decimal places in the uh, evidence we have. Um, of course, the ancient Babylonians didn't use base 10, so they, they used base 60, uh, but that's an entirely different story. Uh, so there's a long pedigree to these numerical methods, but people are still using them uh, all the time. <laughs>